Oh, look, I almost forgot to record. Look at that. I did hit record, though. Ah, before I started. Look at me being all professional, y'all. Hitting record's a good thing. Yes, it is. All right. Hello and welcome to Learning the Law, a podcast about all things legal with a focus on current events, where we try to teach you things in one hour. My name is Ashley, aka Phoenix Nymphy, my co-host, who is the man of the hour and the person who doesn't have to worry about hitting the record button, my husband, Ron. The podcast Hello. is purely educational and should not be taken as legal advice. This podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship. This podcast is based on his interpretation of relevant law. And any opinions, mostly mine, expressed are the opinions of the individual making them and do not reflect the opinions of any firm, company, or other individuals. Ron is a licensed practicing attorney in the state of California. Yes, I am and have been since September 15th of 1999. Oh, that yeah. was last century. Uh, technically, yes. Yes. Last millennium, too. Yes. Yes. I'm old. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I went basic white bitch and went to Starbucks today. And got some kind of strawberry coffee. Yeah. So I do like their strawberries and cream frappuccino at Starbucks. And they have this new thing called strawberry funnel cake. Frappuccino and it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's not bad. I can taste the flavor. Like I can taste the strawberry, but it. I, I'm a person who doesn't like. I like the effects of coffee. I don't like the flavor of coffee. So if something is ex exceptionally coffee flavored. I'm not the biggest fan of it. And this is a little, little too coffee ish. A lot of caramel stuff at at Starbucks is very coffee flavored. Um. I do tend to go when we I, I prefer to shop at smaller local coffee shops, but our regular one is clo closes at three because the pandemic kind of. Uh, they had to adjust hours due to the pandemic and stuff. Um, and uh, they have this really, really delicious chai latte, which I realize is not coffee, which is why I love it. It's so good. <laughs> It's so good. Anyway, uh, I'm definitely a tea person more than a coffee person. Anyway, um, I like the coffee. So, yeah, we're supposed to do this on Tuesday, but. Um, well, you know what? We just do it when I feel up to it, because, well, I deal with a lot of mental health issues. And when I get very, very tired, there's no there's no way you're going to wake me up. There's no way you're going to get me to do anything. And yesterday I decided to sleep all day. Um, I'm pretty sure there's something more going on there, but uh, we'll get to it. Hopefully, um, you know, I, I hate that. I, that's something that I, I hate that I sleep as much as I do, but I don't kill myself for it. Like, I don't hate myself for it. It's like, that's just how my body works right now. This is just what my body does. I, I shouldn't like listen to your body because it's the only way you're going to get better. Right. So if your body is asking for a lot of sleep, let your body sleep. Yeah. Um, your body wants to sleep for a reason. Yeah. And I have the ability to be able to do that. Um, you know, not everybody has the ability to be able to do that, but I do. And I'm very grateful for it. And I'm hoping we've every year. Oh, oh, I am not a professional podcaster and I totally did not turn. I totally didn't put my phone on vibrate. So, yes, that's a thing that I need to do. Uh, there we go. Phones on vibrate. <laughs> uh, well, oh, yeah. After, you know, when you're when your insurance changes every year, it's really hard to stay up to date on your medical stuff, especially with the medical stuff we've had to deal with the last few years. But I'm hoping now that you have a job that is much better, actually isn't going to change insurance every year like your last job. Um, 
maybe things can kind of settle down in the medical stuff for us and we can figure out, you know, those underlying conditions and figure out what's going on and causing me to be the way that I am. <laughs> well, I hope so. Anyway, and we're I hope not here to talk about me and my medical stuff, but that's how my week has been. And that's how we'd like to start off the podcast. How's your week been? Mine? Yes. Uh, last podcast. How's, uh, you know, how's tricks? Well, uh, my leg's doing fine. Yes. The surgeon doesn't want to see me for five weeks. Yes, we did go so to the surgeon yesterday. Thing. Yes, yes. Um, physical therapy went fine. Finally got onto the weight machines. Yes. Instead of those resistance bands. So that went well. It's the first time I've actually been tired from physical therapy. Good. Um, my old job, which is still my current job until the 15th, doesn't know what they're doing. And what's new with that? I mean, I've been, to I've been told I wasn't going to get any new tasks. I just need to finish everything that's been assigned to me, which is an impossibility, by the way. I have things assigned to me that are due in December of 2021. Right. Um, since they told me that, I've been given nothing but new tasks and haven't been able to accomplish any of the tasks that have been assigned to me. Not my problem anymore. Someone's going to have to do them. Hmm. So I just had something pop across my computer and it's something that uh, it's not what our our topic is on today, but it's a headline that I'm going to read to you. OK, I don't have time to read the article, but the article is the New York Times. Yes, your employer can require you to be vaccinated. So quickly, can you explain why legally your employer can require you to get vaccinated? Uh, well, for one, if somebody, if they hire somebody who's not vaccinated and then somebody at work gets COVID, yeah. they can sue their employer for an unsafe work environment. And not only that, Here. if you are, if you're like a workplace that deals with the general public, you know, any, any kind of retail and you don't get vaccinated and they require you to get vaccinated and someone gets sick and then a a client or a uh, consumer gets sick or you know any anybody that comes in gets sick they can then sue the company right so it's to protect themselves secondly uh being unvaccinated is not a protected class and by that i mean you can't discriminate against the unvaccinated there's no problem with discrimination against the unvaccinated. It's not in the Constitution that unvaccinated people are protected like it is race, religion, national origin, uh, in California, sexual orientation, gender identification. Yeah. Um, which actually, that kind of kind of segues into the first thing that we're going to talk about. Uh, today we're talking about the Supreme Court docket. So, uh, what is a docket? Explain what a docket is. A docket is basically just the calendaring and organization of the cases that they're going to hear through a year. So it's just now, a lineup of cases that they they have. Right. The Supreme Court hears cases uh, beginning in October. And then throughout the year, they will hear new arguments. They usually wrap up all the oral arguments they're going to hear by about February, March of the following year. And then the, uh, the rulings start coming down after that. And the rulings will come from February, March, all the way into June, July. Okay. And then they'll take, they'll take off August and September. And then they start again the, their new year on October. So the year for them is kind of like the school year. It's not the calendar that everybody goes by year. It's a different type of year. Right. And that's generally because 
Uh, none of the Supreme Court justices historically wanted to be in Washington, D.C. during the hot and humid summer. That makes sense. Fun fact. Fun fact that we both learned this week, actually. Uh, the Supreme Court used to not have a place that they called home. They used to not have a building. They used to meet in people's living rooms. They yes. used to, uh, you know, just hang out and actually work out of um, the the Capitol. Sometimes, sometimes the Capitol building. Yeah. Um, um, sometimes it was just a potluck dinner. Yeah. The building that they actually are in used to house the National Women's was it Society? Um, I believe the NWS. Yes. Yeah. The National Women's Society where they were, you know, trying to get women's rights and work on women's rights. That yeah, was they, bulldozed to make the Supreme Court building. Yes. So, and um, very symbolic. Yeah, it's very symbolic considering one of the uh, biggest things that they're going to be looking at probably next year, not this year, is uh, Roe v. Wade. And I would like to do a a podcast in September of the upcoming cases, big cases yeah. that the Supreme Court will be listening to. So the Roe v. Wade, the abortion case is not going to be this year. It will be the next year. So starting in October is probably where the new where they will be looking at that again and deciding whether or not to overturn that. And I know that's a big case that a lot of people want to know about, especially with the most recent Texas abortion. We can uh, do bills an episode just on that case. We can because most people don't even know what the case is actually about. Yeah, we should uh, we should. When it gets closer to that, we'll actually do an entire podcast on just Roe v. Wade and what that actual case is. In fact, I'd actually like to do that with some really, really big cases that. OK, um, just focusing on those cases. But anyway, um, so back to the medical stuff. Uh, California versus Texas. It's a challenge to the Affordable Care Act. There's my yeah. segue that was really bad, you know. There are 23 cases the Supreme Court hasn't given a ruling on. Okay. And there's really four big ones that people are looking at um, and anticipating rulings coming from. Uh, the first, uh, California v. Texas, it's another challenge to Obamacare. Yes which in 2012 was upheld as being constitutional. And the reason it was uh, upheld as being constitutional is because Justice Chief Justice Roberts found that uh, the tax mandate, you know, the penalty uh, that you would pay in your taxes if you didn't have any health insurance on your own, uh, uh, he found that that to be an actual tax and since it was a tax congress had the power to levy that legislation because only congress has the power to levy taxes according to the constitution okay can you explain that in layman's terms yeah the president can't say i'm going to uh, give a tax on corporations 50 percent can't do it only congress can do that only congress can do it right and so when they passed this legislation, they put in a penalty for people. Right, right. $695 if you didn't have any insurance on your own. Which I think is kind of messed up personally. Okay. Um, and basically, Chief Justice Roberts said that penalty, since it's part of your taxes and you would have to pay in your 1040 form if you mm -hmm. didn't have it was a tax that Congress could levy and therefore it was constitutional. Well, that's, but that's what they were arguing against that particular time was this is unconstitutional because this tax thing is not constitutional. And that's they, what made that decision. The, correct. The people that were against uh, uh, the affordable care act, also known as Obamacare. Um, didn't call it a tax though. They just called it a penalty. 
Ah, okay. And uh, said it was against individuals' freedom to be mandated to buy something. Well, I mean, we're mandated to buy car insurance. <laughs> yeah, at the state level. Yep. Um, I, I don't know if that's true in all states. It is in California. I think it's true in all states. I think, if not all states, most states have, because it, could, because it affects other people. Right. Um, again. Anyway. Um, also, driving is not a right. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Yeah. Um, vote. Voting is a, a right. Not a privilege. It's a right. There's a difference. It's supposed to be a right. I'm just saying, voting's a right. You, you you ruined you ruined it. You ruined it by saying it's supposed to be a right. It is a right, not a privilege. There's a difference. Um. So, what is the California versus Texas issue like? What it, what are they looking at? <laughs> Okay, the issue now is in 2017, uh, the Congress got rid of that that penalty. Oh, so they did? No yeah, they did. Okay. So it's no longer part of the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Thusly, the reason for the Affordable Care Act that the Supreme Court in 2012 said made it constitutional is gone. So now... Okay. Yeah. So now, um, Texas, I believe, is the one that brought the original lawsuit saying the whole thing needs to be scrapped now because the whole thing's unconstitutional. So I'm going to be okay. I'm, I'm going to throw in some personal anecdotes here. Um, Due to the Affordable Care Act, uh, we were able to get insurance. Um, I was outright told that I could not get health insurance through the independent market before the Affordable Care Act went through because I'm a woman, because I have a uterus and I am too, I mean, and as a woman, it's considered a it as a woman, as a woman, as someone born with a uterus and ovaries, I am considered someone who's born with a pre-existing condition. That is how sexist the medical field and the insurance companies are against women and people who deal, who have uteruses and ovaries. So. Well, I am going to say there are women that have health insurance. I'm not saying there's, they're not. You're pulling the all lives matter bullshit right now. Don't do that. What I'm, I'm, I'm saying, just... what I'm saying is the fact that insurance companies use those biases to not give people insurance who need the insurance. My best friend who died at the age of 29 was born with cancer and she had, um, neur I can't remember the type of dwarfism Newman. was that she, was it was like Newman. Newman's or neur neuron. I cannot remember it's. And I'm not going to try to think of it right now. Um, but she was born that way. But she was born with these pre-existing conditions. Had it not been for the Affordable Care Act extending that insurance from for kids to be able to be on insurance for their parents up to 26, she would not have been able to have life-altering, life-saving surgery when she did. Because she had to have certain things replaced. She had to have a melody valve replacement when she was around 24 and she wouldn't have been able to afford that has she not had the insurance um because she was still under her parents insurance because she was in school you know she was still in college um so there i mean there are things there's a lot wrong with the affordable care act like i don't like that it is required to have health insurance i don't that like I like that they took away that penalty. You shouldn't be penalized for that. But um, insurance companies are not are are not should not should not even though they do it should not be in the process of practicing um, practicing law or practicing um, medicine. medicine because they're not the ones who are actually 
looking at me, right? You're not the one who's looking at me and saying, okay, we can take care of this. You should not have the right to say, oh, uh, you need that law, life altering surgery. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not going to do that. I mean, it literally killed Ron's sister-in-law. Yes, it did. It literally insurance literally killed her sister-in-law because they would not. Okay. Something that a doctor said she needed an MRI. They said they, they that they needed the MRI. It would have caught a surge. It would have caught cancer. At the time, it would have been treatable. Yes. And the doctor has on record stated that. And like his brother is going through a whole issue like with that whole situation. And because that is insurance companies should not be allowed to do that. They just shouldn't. So the ruling that they cannot drop you due to a to due to, you know, overextending and overpaying or whatever. You know what Shit happens? Sometimes people get cancer, right? That's not. I'm sorry. You're not going to prevent cancer. You're not. If you are going to get cancer, you're going to get cancer. Regardless of what you do, you can stay inside your house and never touch any kind of electronic thing and still get cancer. If right. you are if you have a body that if your genetics are predisposed to certain cancers, yes, you can take you can do things to try to prevent it and stay healthy, but if your body's going to get cancer, if your body's going to get sick, it's going to get sick. Certain things you just cannot stop and you shouldn't be punished for it. I don't disagree. Um, and then denying people outright based off of sex, gender, um, race. It, that Because that's what insurance companies used to do all the time. And they can't do that now. So if they overturn, if they overturn and say the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional, that's really, really going to affect so many people and hurt so many people. And I'm done talking about that now. Okay. Um, the thing is, I'm going to say for some reason, uh, Chief Justice Roberts went out of his way to find that penalty as being a tax and saved basically the Affordable Care Act at the time. And he took a ration of shit for it because he was, you know, uh, put on the court by a quote unquote conservative president. So he should be a conservative justice. He has become a little bit more of a swing vote in um, recent years. Him and Kavanaugh, actually. And I wasn't too happy with the appointee. I wasn't too happy with uh, Kavanaugh being appointed when Kavanaugh was appointed. But Kavanaugh has also been a um, a swing. Wait, no, no, no. It is Roberts that I'm thinking of, not Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh yeah. is the one that Trump appointed. Yeah, no, that's the guy yeah. that shouldn't be there either. Because right. he's the sexist. That's him. No, 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 no. It's, uh, yes, Roberts. Yes, yes, yes. Roberts, that's the one that was appointed by Bush. That's who I was talking about earlier. Yes. Yes, he has become kind of a swing vote. Even though he's a little bit more, he's, a le you know, more conservative. I mean, as a justice, you should be unbiased and you should be nonpartisan, right? <laughs> I think I think Roberts did that because he knows the kind of shit that would happen if suddenly 20 million people had no health insurance. It is. And it's going to affect in the millions and, if if there is no more health insurance. Generally, uh, you know, the Supreme Court does look at social ramifications, even if they won't admit to it. Now. I mean, that should be part of their job when they are making these decisions. You're not looking at these decisions based off of who they directly affect, right? Like, you, you're not just looking at who is involved in these particular cases. You're looking at who these, like, the ripple effects that these cases are going to make. Like, it's it may not directly affect us now, 
but it it could still affect us because our insurance our insurance could be changed if it's removed. You know, even if you have insurance through your job, if this law is overturned, insurance as a whole is going to change and it's not going to necessarily be for, it's not going to be for the better. It's going to go back to what it was before. And certain things that are covered now, even through your job, are not going to be covered anymore. You know well, that women getting pregnant is not covered, was not covered under insurance before. Right. Here's the thing. If all of a sudden 20, 30 million people don't have insurance anymore, that means 20 or 30 million people are not getting uh, premiums paid. Insurance companies are not bringing in that money anymore, and they're going to take a hit on their bottom line. And one of the biggest arguments for the Affordable that, Care Act was that the premiums were going to go up. They really didn't go up that much. Overall, no, but getting, getting rid of 20 or 30 million uh, people's revenue to the insurance company is going to make everybody else's premiums go up. It I is. guarantee you that. So when the Affordable Care Act went through and they were required to add certain things like pregnancy, like, so when we, one of the things that we were looking at, you know, before the Affordable Care Act went into place was health insurance through the independent market because we both worked gig work at the time. Um, or contract, I should say contract work for you, gig work for me. Um, so we had to pay for our, our own insurance. It's very common when you are a gig worker to, to, you know, have your own insurance and have to go through the independent market. The problem is, um, if we wanted children, we had to make sure to plan for it and pay for maternity insurance for a year before we could even get pregnant. That was the rule. That was that right. was the rule before the Affordable Care Act went into place. And now that the Affordable Care Act is in place, if we wanted to get pregnant, like we have learned now that it's not pregnancy isn't going to happen for us. But say we were a couple who could get pregnant and it happened accidentally or say we do. We do actually get pregnant. I don't have to worry about not having insurance cover that. Because right. it'll get covered. I don't I don't have to worry about trying to pay all of that stuff out of pocket. Because it's not it wasn't covered under insurance. It was an additional charge, an additional fee, and you had to pay it. it I mean it was really messed up. So now that is covered, you know. If you right. do get pregnant and if if oh, say I needed to have an abortion, or say I chose to have an abortion, that's covered too. And I don't have to worry about going to some shady place to take care of myself. So the question is, how is the Supreme Court going to rule on this? I don't know. With, a, with, with the, the three people who were appointed by Trump, this could go very poorly. Um, apparently to observers during oral arguments the questions that came from the bench seem to imply that the Affordable Care Act is constitutional even without the penalty being involved so I don't know what they're going to base that on if somehow Roberts manages to once again surprise all the conservative pundits and somehow manipulate a legal argument to save the act. Yeah. It's going to be, it is something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, uh, it is, it's, it's a big, it's a big decision and it's, it's going to affect everyone. And I mean everyone, not just people who right. get their insurance through their marketplace. It's going to affect everyone. Because um, the effect of 20 to 30 million people not having insurance means all they can do is go to the emergency room for the medical care. Because emergency rooms cannot turn away anybody. Right. So it's going to bog down the system. And we're going to have 
the same issue with the pandemic all over again. Right. And those people are going to be going to the emergency room for, you know, a twisted cold ankle, a cold, and- you know, things that like urgent care is a great urgent care. I didn't understand what urgent care was until recently. Actually, urgent care is a great place to go when it is something that you don't need to go to the emergency room for, but you need to go see someone now. You can't wait until you go see your doctor. Urgent care is that perfect thing in between the middle. It really is. Like, say you have a cyst, you know, because I've gotten cysts down there before and I need to go get it removed. Um, because I have woken up with a cyst down there and not been able to walk. Um, urgent care didn't exist then. And I had to go to my doctor. Thank God I was able to get into my doctor, but that would be a perfect thing to go to urgent care for. Right. And um, with the people going, having to go to the emergency room, who's going to be paying those bills? Right. That's going to affect the medical cost of everybody else. Because they're not going to have the insurance to, they're not going to have the money to pay for the emergency room bill. So, Right. Everything, the medicals, like it'll, it'll, everything will go up and become right. way more expensive than it is now. And once medical bills <laughs> reach a certain point, um, you know, you can't repossess a, a new kidney or a, anything like that, like you could a house or a car. And I mean, how many Chapter times seven. have you, how many times have you said, medical is what people file bankruptcy for is the most the most in my opinion it's bad if they turn this over yeah i think i do think i don't like a lot of what roberts uh votes on and the way he votes in his decisions but i think he realizes that the Affordable Care Act needs to stay. Now, can something better come along? Absolutely. God, yes, something better can come along. This is a good stepping stone to improving the medical in this country, though. something better should come along. Yes, this should not be the end. But we shouldn't be going backwards to fix it. We should go forward. Because despite any rhetoric that people are saying there is no replacement plan Mm -mm. if this fails. We'll literally go backwards, back to where it was before, just 10 years ago. Right. I mean, all of the Affordable Care Act is not that old. It's not. And if it weren't for the Affordable Care Act, we would not have had insurance. Most of our marriage yeah i i wasn't able to get insurance in my life until 2012 because of pre-existing conditions yeah oh and being fat is considered a pre-existing condition yes it it is so and and guess what most of the country is like 70 to 80 percent of the country are overweight or obese so yeah, your BMI is too high. So we can either we won't deny go you off on that we tangent. You. We won't go we'll off on the double. tangent yeah. of BMIs. But yeah. So moving on, what's our next? What's the next uh, case? Okay. Uh, the next case that people are looking at is called Bronovich versus the Democratic National uh, Committee. I thought it was like convention. Wait, is DNC the con- it, is it, it committee or D- convention or is it interchangeable? It's committee. The convention okay. is what they put on. Okay. To nominate okay, okay. The president. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the issue in this case is Arizona has banned the practice of what they call ballot harvesting. And what ballot harvesting is, is a third party who gathers up people's ballots and brings them to the election center to be counted. So Arizona has banned that. 
and they've also banned voting in the wrong precinct, whether or not it's a good faith mistake or not. So, okay, the way you express that, the way you said that, ballot harvesting, especially with that terminology and like a third party, yeah, that does kind of sound shady, but uh, let's let's actually discuss what what he means by third parties. Third parties are, say you have a, you know, it's an old folks home and you have a nurse who gathers up all of their ballots and takes it to be uh, counted, you know, because they can't yeah. necessarily get up and, you know, go. Um, or say you have like me and Ron, like just your you taking your spouse's voter card or you taking your your spouse's ballot to um the Election polling thing. place yeah. is third that's the third harvest that that or that's the ballot harvesting that's considered ballot harvesting me taking ron's ballot with mine would be a third party thing mine would get voted mine would get used but his would not according Correct. to what arizona is trying to do um it, oh they've done it Okay, so this person is it, trying to stop that from ha happening. Sorry, hiccups. So right, the, the DNC is basically suing Arizona over the practice of what they, they passed. So who's Bronovich? Is that uh, he's probably the Arizona Secretary of State. Oh, okay. So it's the, okay, when they say Bronovich versus DNC, it sounds like it's Bronovich bringing it to the DNC, not Shouldn't it be DNC it, versus Bronovich? It probably was originally, but when things go up on appeal, things change. Oh, okay. Plaintiffs become respondents. Gotcha, you know, gotcha, and, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, okay, so the DNC is basically saying this is illegal um, and this should not be allowable due to the Voting Rights Act. Right, so the DNC... Uh, Position one at the appellate level, the Ninth Circuit. And so uh, Bronovich is the one that brought the appeal to the Supreme Court. Okay. That's why it's Bronovich versus DNC. So, what is the DNC's argument? Uh, according to your notes, it says Section 2 under Voting Rights Act of 1965. So, it sounds like I'm, I'm high or. Uh, Drunk? I swear right. to God, I'm not. Right. Section two <laughs> prohibits the voting practices that result in a denial or abridgment of the right to vote on account of race or color. And it states that such a result is established if a jurisdiction's political processes are not equally open to members of such a group. So, historic. Wait, hold up. Based off of that. That means all of the voter suppression laws that have gone into place are illegal. Like the one, like that right there, like the shit that Georgia has pulled, excuse me, the crap that Georgia has pulled, that that's illegal. Like that right there says that that's illegal. And those cases are coming up. Okay. But the reason people are looking at this one is it was this will recent. tell you, this will tell you how the Supreme Court views the Voting Rights Act. Okay. If, now, if they don't side with the Voting Rights Act, this that's because I mean that that came from the civil rights. Like that that came due to the work of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., all of them. That Yes, th yes. That came because of their hard work. If that is overturned, that's just a slap in the face of the civil rights movement. Yeah. And that means we're going backwards again. So, so the legal argument is, how does ballot harvesting affect the votes based on race or color? Well, because I can, I, okay, can I... Can I practice an argument on you and see like sure. if this is okay? So in places um 
of uh, marginalized communities, lower income pla- uh, lower income areas, there are not many places to take your, there's not a, enough voting. One, there's, it's been proven that there's not enough voting machines. And I mean, obviously if I was in court, I would have all of the stats with me. There's not enough voting machines. There's not enough voting polling places. In fact, they've closed a lot of the vo- the polling places the last election and tried to stop it. Plus, if you have a mail-in ballot, there's not enough places to take to drop your ballot off in these places. They have deliberately been taken up. I mean, even during the Trump, during the Trump era, he was telling the uh, you know, the Postal Service to remove that kind of stuff from mail-in ballots. So when you have people like Stacey Abrams who are gathering people together and trying to gather things together to help make it easier for them to vote, that is to help ease the burden on those people who cannot otherwise make it to a voting place. Right. That's why this is now, illegal, in the, my the, opinion. The, the counter argument to that is it's going to affect all voters in those areas, not just people of color. It's going to affect white voters, too, and therefore it's not discrimination. How can you say it's not discrimination? It's clearly I'm, discrimination. I'm not saying that. That's the argument. I know, but I'm just saying, like, how can you say that it's not discrimination? Because all you have to do is look at demo- demographics of the area and show there's like 5% white and like 85% black and like 10, like what? We have what? 10% left. And it's like 10% Hispanic in that particular area. It's not difficult to show the demographics of these areas. That's not no. difficult, especially with the census that just came out. I agree. But that's the argument before the Supreme Court. So what we just said, as someone who is not a professional attorney, I still got the argument right on the side that's trying to stop Arizona. The effect of the ban is discriminatory in nature. Of course it is. Absolutely. And the other side of the argument is, no, it's not because it affects everyone equally. But it doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. No. It all depends what the judges this on the court see. I mean, I I see it clear as day, but I know, like, I don't some of these cases, I'm just like, I don't, I don't okay. Like now you got three justices that are are going to vote that it's discriminatory in nature. Yeah. You have uh, six other judges that are on the conservative side. I don't know that Roberts would find that to be uh, discriminatory or not. I tend to think he would. I hope. But even uh, so, that's still five Thomas? to four. Clarence Thomas says we'll find that to be non-discriminatory, and that's disappointing considering he's a freaking black man. Like, I don't understand. He finds a lot of things to be not discriminatory, which is outrageous to me as a freaking black man. And then you've got um, you, it's so uh, you I mean, the your path to become a chief justice had to have been hard. I mean, I've never looked up, you know, his, you know, their road right to become a chief justice. But he had to it had to have been difficult for him to be a uh, chief justice as a black man. Right. Especially. W- is he a Clinton era? Or is he before Clinton? Thomas? Yeah. When was he? He was nominated by uh, Reagan. Oh, so he's a Reagan. Okay. Yeah. So it just it's just like. As a man from Georgia. I just don't understand. 
not just Georgia, but Savannah, Georgia, right? Like, there's... All you have to do is step into Savannah. It's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous city. But you can see the effects. You can see the effects of racism and the Civil War in Savannah. Like, it is... Oh, absolutely. Like... And just as someone who is from a, you know, deep South, I just, I'm blown away at the things that he votes for. I don't understand what goes on in his mind. I do not understand Clarence Thomas's decisions. And I don't agree with most of his voting. It's just weird to me. Yeah, he he is. He's not a concern. He's an arch conservative. He doesn't even ask questions generally during oral arguments because his mind is already made up. Yeah, it really is like he's. Mm. Anyway. Uh... No, you're going to have the three newest justices make the decision on this. I don't know how Kavanaugh is going to vote uh. on this. I don't know his record on uh, discrimination law. Same with uh, Gorsuch. I will say uh, she has not or not not she that's um, Barrett hasn't um she hasn't voted conservative on everything so i will give her that right neither has gorsuch yeah gorsuch out of all of the trump era justices gorsuch was the only one that i was like okay <sighs> he didn't have quite as many problems as the others but still, um, oh, yeah. So this one is going to be a pure toss up. It's going to um, be this is this is another one that one of the things that I'm noticing if these get if these are go the way of what GOP wants, uh, it's going to set us back like ba we're going to go backwards. And that's uh, not a good thing. Now, there is legislation going through Congress. Uh, I believe it's called For the People Act that will render this whole decision moot. If it passes, it will pass the House of Representatives. It won't pass the Senate. Right. Unless be the a Democrats get rid of the filibuster. There'll be a, a yes, and um, Mansion can go. We're podcasting, so I'm gonna watch my mouth on this one. But Mansion is. Mm, so the other day, somebody's like, "He's not a Democrat; he's a Republican because he's funded by the Koch brothers." And I'm like, "You know what? I'm not gonna play that game because he claims himself to be a Democrat. Democrats also suck." Yeah, like I he, mean, you can also be a Democrat and suck. Just here's my they, like just problem he's with not Manchin. voting with Democrats doesn't mean he's a Republican. It just means he's a crappy Democrat. Here, here's the problem with Manchin. He believes in bipartisanship. Which no, what I don't understand why. And this bipartisan may have worked in the '60s and '70s a little bit into the 80s, but ever since Newt Gingrich and his contract with America, there is no bipartisanship. What? H Newt Gingrich? What? I'm yeah. sorry. What 94. Is, what? Okay. All in right. Well, I was Clinton. a child in 94, so can you explain in, that a little bit? Yeah. In 94, <laughs> Newt Gingrich came up with this uh, contract with America, and if you were part of the GOP, you had to sign on to it and adhere to these particular platforms. And ever since then, and ever since then, there has been such a divided Congress that they cannot work with each other. 
Democrats can't work with Republicans. Republicans can't work with Democrats. That's so stupid. Wow. Okay. Well. So but okay. Certain certain old Democrats, Joe Biden, Manchin, still think it's possible to be bipartisan. Can't be when McConnell has come out and said we are going to work one hundred percent against the Biden agenda. Well, Where's the bipart? He said the same thing. With when Obama. Obama was in office and nothing yeah. got done then either. Right. Like you cannot like, and the thing is, ugh, I just don't under, oh, we got to get these old white dudes out of office. <laughs> we got to get these old white dudes out of office, man. I love Bernie Sanders, but you know, it's time to get more people in that mindset. AOC, more people like Bernie Sanders, but younger we got it. Anyway, moving on. Moving on. Next case. <laughs> Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia. This is the third big case that still hasn't been ruled on. And this involves a uh, Catholic adoption service <laughs> that has a contract with the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia has mandated that you cannot discriminate against, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but I'm going to try it anyway, LGBTQ+. Plus, um, families that are looking to adopt children. And that is part of the contract that they signed. However, this Catholic uh, agency has ignored that and will not consider anyone but uh straight white couples heteronormative couples okay but you signed a thing with the the state you you signed a thing like this is this is beyond this is no like the state isn't religious you cannot push your religious agenda on no that's then then they need to then they need to stop working with the Catholic Church. They need to stop working with religious affiliations then if if they can't. That will be the effect. Like, sep- I'm sorry, I, I'm a Christian and I 100% believe you should separate church and state. And on that note, and I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> 1946. A documentary. I highly recommend looking it up. In fact, I'm going to link it at the bottom of this. 1946 is when homosexuality was added into the Bible and mistranslated. Homosexuality before that has never existed in the Bible, which means it is not a sin. And in fact, if you do your research on the Bible, you will learn that what they are talking about is pedophilia. They're not talking about homosexuality. The angels were gay. Did you know that? The angels were gay. Did you also know that if you are a Christian and you believe that Jesus died for everyone, that means Jesus died for your gay people. Jesus died for the alphabet mafia. Yes, that's right. Jesus died for those people that you hate. So stop using Jesus to justify your hate. Okay. Moving right along. The Catholic Church cannot... I'm sorry, but the Catholic Church is wrong in this case. Also, the Catholic Church upholds pedophilia and doesn't do shit about it. Well, you know how I feel about that. There are some, some people that need to be thrown in jail for the rest of their life for that. So if we not really only does the talk government about sin and deal with sin, maybe the Catholic Church needs to focus on themselves for a while. Yes, the I'm getting very, them. very angry right now. You are. But I really, really, really despise the hypocrisy that comes from the Catholic Church as a whole. And I have friends who are Catholic and they're not terrible people because individually <laughs> people are good. But as a whole, people are bad. To to me, this is a simple contract issue. 
you signed up for it. You knew what you're signing up for. Don't sign up for it if you can't fulfill your obligations. Yeah, they and honestly, I mean, we were looking at a foster care system um, that was through our church when we were in Georgia. And we were like, yeah, we would like to be involved in this. We want to, you know, help kids out. Um, but what turned us off on to it, what turned us off from it is because. So the program that they have is a great program. Um, and it's very smart and very intelligent and kind of, and it actually is beneficial to the kids and helps stabilize the kids. Um, it's a whole system. It's not, it, they work on a whole system, not just getting foster parents, but also getting babysitters that are qualified to be babysitters, people that can help financially with the assistance because you only get so much money when it comes to foster care. Um, and sometimes you need a little bit extra. Uh, people who just, they do, they create an entire community around these foster kids, which is so smart. And they do foster to adopt, which is like the program itself is just a beautiful program, but they don't do LGBTQI couples. And that right there, I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I can't support this. I cannot support this because gay couples and non heteronormative couples can be wonderful parents too. And there's nothing wrong with it. And we have to pull away from those religious biases when it comes to taking care of children. We right, have to pull the religion away from that. There's too many kids that are in foster care that don't have any guidance in their life. Yeah. There's too many kids that need help. And Yes, I think it's great that churches are helping where they need to help. But I also think that churches need to understand that a community is more than just people in the church. And sometimes those people are not the people you would expect. Sometimes they're gay or trans or bi or black or Hispanic. You know, like a community is not just white, hetero, sexual, church going people. That's not what a community makeup is. That's what a KKK rally makeup is. Okay. On the other side of the argument. Really hard to follow that up, isn't it? Yeah. On the other side of the argument. You're welcome. Is the is the church saying it's their religious freedom? Re but separation of church and state, you sign a contract, your religious freedom is moot when it comes to working with the government like that. Sorry. It should be, but it, not necessarily, because this has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. Which I find insane that it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. And uh, Gorsuch is all about religious liberty in his in his uh ruling so far. Yeah. Well, so, they've also been trying to set back LGBTQI um uh rulings like trying to overturn the marriage stuff. Like they've been trying to do that since it was approved. I mean, there's there's a um the the gay community is uh, losing ground, especially within, within the with the trans uh, area of the community. Uh, they they've lost some ground. I I do expect the Supreme Court to side with the Catholic Church. In this. You do. I do. You've got. I know. I hope it doesn't. Yeah. With it, with the, the the new justices that Trump appointed, you've got Amy Coney Barrett, who is a yeah devout Catholic. You've got Gorsuch, who's all about religious liberty arguments. That gives you your five right there. Yeah, you know, even if Roberts and Kavanaugh side with, uh, yeah, that's four to five to four. Oh, it's a shame, man. It's a shame. So what the effect of that should be the city of Philadelphia 
no longer employs the services of the Catholic Church in their adoptions. If that's what if that's if that's what happens, yeah. I mean and it sucks because what really sucks is Catholics, well, of course Catholics are known for adoption agencies because they kidnapped and killed a lot of children over the years. Are you speaking of the indigenous in Canada? Oh, they did it here too. They've done it here too. I know it just recently came out in Canada. It's a mass grave or something. Well, I'm not, no, not it didn't. I it. mean, it didn't recently come out. The stuff. So they recently found a mass grave. And the thing That's is, what I mean. um, it's been not like the last school closed in 1996. Like this is recent. This is not old history. This is recent history. Um, and uh, the Catholic Church ha- did that everywhere. That's, I don't like the Catholic Church because of that. They don't, they don't admit their wrongdoings and they don't fix their wrongdoings. They just sweep it under the rug. And they use the government, any government, to do that. And if you read any freaking history book, and I mean, and I'm talking about like, I just read, I've read The Six Wives of Henry VIII, and I'm now reading Mary Queen of Scots. And the Catholic Church literally makes its, made its decisions based off of the sway of the politics of the time. That's not how they should be making their decisions, but they do. So, right. That was the whole reason why they do things in Latin, or at least they used to. Yeah. It's, and it's, that's why they wanted to keep the Bible Latin only. So you would have to go to the church to read it for, you know, to have it read to you instead of reading it for yourself. It's also why it's extremely, it's also why there's a lot of mistranslations of the Bible and why you should always look at it. At any history book, anything in history, any text, anything that is extremely old, you should always look at the original text to make sure that it is accurate and look at the history of it over the years and never take it it at face value. If you have the ability to do that, don't ever take it at face value. I believe the oldest uh, versions we have of the the New Testament are... 200 years after the events yeah and now they're saying the dead sea scrolls were faked some of the dead sea scrolls were faked so um yeah i haven't haven't heard that but yeah anyway we're gonna move right along because we're getting uh we are definitely past our hour so our final uh Final one is Mahoney, Mahanoy Area School District. I don't think I'm saying that right. Yeah. Mahanan. Mahanoy Area School District. Mahanoy Area School District versus versus BL. Brandy Levy. Uh, She was, she was identified as BL because she was a minor at the time. Ah, okay. And basically what this involves is A high school cheerleader got pissed off because she didn't make the varsity squad. And she went on a social. She went on a social media rant. So the school uh, penalized her. Uh, I believe they took her off of all cheerleading. She couldn't do some other things. I don't know if they threatened her graduation or not. And the issue is. Does the school have the right to censor your off-campus utterances? No. As opposed to doing that on campus? No. Well, my blanket statement is no, but the, the thing is, if you're... If you're on social media going on a tirade and and screaming slurs and being racist, homophobic, hateful, 
um, causing harm to someone with your social tirades, yeah, there should be some some consequences. But if you're just, you know, complaining and moaning and crying about not making the squad and like this place sucks and my life is gonna suck and I <laughs> okay, whatever. So, no. So now let, here's let her, the, here's let her the, get it out. But here's the argument that the school district has brought. That if you, they can't monitor this kind of, of talk, this kind of posting, then it's going to make it harder to curb bullying, racism, cheating, invasions of privacy, all the stuff that happens online. Okay, so what would they do if she did that and it wasn't on social media? Like, what if she just went on a tirade with her friends at the mall? Like, what's the difference? Uh, the amount of people that you reach generally. Okay. Um, if she did that on campus, they could, you know, put her in detention. But what were her tweets? Yeah. Like, what was she? I what, don't know. What was her tie? That's, I, see, that's, I don't have those. For me, I need to see what her tweets were about. Because, I mean, like, I've seen these little kids on, like, TikTok and stuff talking about how big and bad they are and how, like, they're going to shoot up, you know, so and so and you know how race and like claiming and saying racist stuff and doing racist things and you know being hateful right yeah heck yeah like the school has every right to go whoa 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 no i, I don't think they should here, i don't think the school should like oh kick them out of school but like okay say you've got this footballer who's Talking about how, you know, being cocky and being like racist and stuff, they can bench the footballer or kick him off the team. Like, all right, dude, you, you want to be big and bad? You don't have to be on the football team. Right? Like Now, the ACLU <laughs> has argued that students need protection from censorship and they should have freedom of speech yes. and not have their beliefs monitored. Yes. Unless it's hateful okay. and it's going to harm somebody. But like, if she's just crying about not making the varsity team or getting or whatever, that's not hurting anybody. She's upset and she wants to be, you know, let her. OK, let her be angry about it. Who gives a crap? Now, if she had gone on and been like they let, you know, she had made some racist remarks and were like they chose this, you know, black girl over me because she's black and she doesn't deserve it. And was like a little bit, a little bit more harmful. Mm, I probably have a conversation with her. Yeah. But I mean, generally speaking, you should have the right, even as a child, to speak your mind. So and I like I do think there should be consequences to your actions online. And I and I understand where the school's coming from, but I think that they're just butt hurt that she said something about them and they can't do anything about it. You know, Not I, I complained about my teachers all the time growing up. I probably would have on social media if it existed. Like, yeah, me too. Like, I'm sorry, but I think the school's wrong with this one. Now here's the thing. Uh, legal scholars have looked at this case, um, have argued that all the existing judicial precedents that draw a bright line between censorship of on-campus and off-campus expressions, which are, quote, disruptive of school communities, are not applied clearly or equally. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And um, I, I personally so think there's a line that you can draw there that's very clear and very evident. If it's I, harming someone, obviously you want to, that should be consequential. If it's not harming someone, and I don't mean physically, I mean also mentally, because bullying is mental. It's not just physical. I got bullied constantly as a kid, but it was more mental than it was physical. I never really, I got into like scraps as an elementary school, but once I hit middle school, high school, it was more mental. It was more of a mental game. And so, yes, bullying should be punished. It's never going to go away. But 
there is a line and there is a clear line that you can draw and set your boundaries. And if they go over that line, then yes, have those consequences. But if they, if they brush up against that line, don't like they, like if they're not over that line. They don't need to be punished. You just, I mean, you can still have a conversation with them and be like, we're watching you on social media. Be aware. Cause that's going to scare a kid too. Well, I I'll play devil's advocate on this. It's not going to scare a bully when you have a bully as president. And that's how you get ahead and get elected to government in this day and age. Well, we're not talking about the president. No, I'm just, I'm just making an observation. I, I understand that. I I completely understand that, but I don't think that's a valid argument in this case. I'm just saying it you're not going to stop bullying when you have an example as Trump. I, and okay. I'll say that. Okay. Generally speaking, you can draw a line that is clear and evident and it will take care of the problem. I'm not disagreeing This I don't with think that. is over that line either. Well, it depends. I'd have to, without seeing her tweets and assuming she just went on a tirade, just, you know, bitching and complaining about not making the varsity team. Um, I would have to say, uh, I doubt that would cover that would, that would close the line. You know, that would go over the line. If now, she was, now if she was talking about wanting to, you know, obviously shoot up the school. That's, clear but i mean unless she's talking about being harmful or harming herself or because i mean kids that you know do the whole i'm just gonna kill myself they may be saying it for attention but that's a real thought that goes through their head and that means they need help there is no evidence that she was ever talking about suicide or killing anybody that's good see then she was just complaining because she she didn't make the team and you know that happens kids get now, upset when they the don't court make of the appeal team. did uh rule on her side i mean as as, as so what i would who, as someone who was a cheerleader early you know because her mom wanted her to be a cheerleader and then you know totally said no i'm done with that by high school um and i think cheerleaders can be very I mean, um, our, cheerleaders, kids can be our cheerleaders in our high school are actually pretty cool and pretty supportive. I got to say that. I actually like the girls in our school. So they actually changed my mind on how cheerleaders were. Uh, so anyhow. Sorry. I mean, I, it's really uh, it's really easy to go cheerleader. Ah, whatever. She's just crying, moaning. You know what? That's a big deal for kids. Like making a team of some sort. Sometimes. Kids, they really want to be a cheerleader or they really want to be in the band or they really want to be, you know, on, you know, in the art right. club it's or whatever. Relevant to the law. That she's a cheerleader. No, no. Right. It's not relevant. It's the fact that, like, she should not be punished for being upset for not making the team, in my opinion. The school doesn't have that right to do that. I'm sorry, but I don't I don't agree with the school in this case. And the Third Circuit Court of Appeals agrees with you. So I'll be interested. I'm really interested to see how this plays out because I understand both sides of this argument. I really understand what the school's trying to do. I get it. Um, because right, because the ramifications the- can go to employment areas. For example, can your employer monitor your? Absolutely. If you are complaining about your employer off, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. But if you are complaining about your employer and actually say their name and talk crap about your employer, I think they have every right to freaking fire you because you are a representative of that employee, of that employer. You're a representative of your employer if you're talking about them on social media. Now, if so you go, is not the student a representative of their school? Different. It's a different concept. How so? She's not working for that school. She is getting an education from that school. She has she has no obligations 
to that school. But as an employee, you have obligations to your employer. Yes, you have rights to be angry. You have rights to be upset. And there's a difference between going, man, I had a crap day at work. I don't like my boss, blah, 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 blah. And going, my boss is blah, 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 blah. They can go to hell. There's a difference. There's a difference. Now, what if you don't say anything about your employer? You don't say anything about what they do. Um, say you put on some uh, some receipt that you don't deserve a tip. And that person then puts that and it goes viral and they find out who it was. And then what? I'm then so confused. What you're, I'm, I'm confused. You don't. I'm talking about off employment, social media. Okay, so say like you you are say I'm a waiter and you write and you are eating or whatever and you don't give me a tip and you write on there you don't deserve a tip, right? And then you get fired because of your right. behavior. Right. Um, I think this can have the same ramifications. This I think ruling can go as far as that. Personally, I think it's at the discretion of the employer. I do. I know that's like I now I think it's wrong to fire a teacher because they're having a drink, right? Um because they're like not the same thing. Um I've seen I they're not necessarily partying, they're just at like a barbecue or whatever and they have a drink in their hand. I think that's wrong. I do think that's wrong. I don't think that's right to fire a teacher because they happen to be having a beer at a barbecue, right? Now, if the teacher's right, going clubbing every night or like there was this, uh, there was the case about the teacher doing burlesque and one of her videos was found and um, the kids were like, and she got fired, right? I think, right. That's, I do think that's wrong. She didn't promote it at school. She didn't promote it at school. She didn't let anybody at the school know that ke- the kids just happened to come across it. And I think that is a problem with our society about over-sexualizing uh, women and s- looking at women as objects. That's just what she does off campus. She, did, she wasn't harming anybody. She wasn't hurting anybody. She was doing absolutely no wrong. She was just, it was just her hobby. And she got fired. That's wrong. Because your kids can't keep it in their pants so and your can kids you see have a problem. How a ruling in this case can go way beyond I do. just I a do. school and a student. I do. I do. I see it. And that's why it's being monitored. I do. I see it. But I also think that when it comes to social media, there are clear cut lines. There are more clear cut lines than people want to admit when it comes to social media monitoring. I also think as individuals, we need to learn to not post everything online. And we need to learn that there will be ramifications and consequences to how we act and behave. I mean, even even without social media, if your employer finds out that you are a racist, bigoted, person and you were at a KKK rally and you helped uh you know burn a cross at somebody's in somebody's yard even though social media like pre they still have the right to fire you for that like they still have the right to fire you for that they can still say oh that is not what we uphold we are not okay with that bye bye right social right. media just means that not everything's as hidden as it used to be. And the major problem you have is you have uh, generally old people ruling on this who don't necessarily understand the ramifications of social media. Yes. I do think that we need to teach our kids how to deal with social media, but I I also think that like as 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 a the generation that grew up at the beginning of social media, at the beginning of the Internet, this is all stuff that we have learned ourselves 
And this is how, why we should be the ones making these decisions. We should be the ones making these decisions. We should be the ones making the decisions on the internet. And um, because we're the ones who, our generation and below are the ones who started on the, who like, we understand it just like, uh, and, and because of the, the, um, technology and progress that has been made. I think we can make better decisions. It's, it is on an individual level. We have to do better, but yeah. on a, on a, you know, bigger on a grand scale we also have to do better so and we have to understand that our actions will lead to consequences always you always have to be careful and that's like and Uh, and to be quite honest when you do go on a rant on social media you don't actually feel better just just a little tidbit you actually feel worse because you're continuing that bad feeling so if you're initial reaction when you are angry is to go to social media and post about it think about that stop stop that and step back now the question is how is the supreme court going to rule on this i don't know it'll be really interesting though to see how they rule on it because that's i'm going to predict that they will side on the cheerleader you think so i do I also think that they will give some guidelines. Yeah, I can see that. As to this issue, because every so often a Supreme Court decision does offer guidelines on whether something is constitutional or not. I think this case is prime for those kind of guidelines. Hopefully, these uh, justices will consult with some of their clerks on how social media actually functions. I will say we do have a few younger people in there. Um, Yes, they are the Trump appointees, but we do have some younger people in there. So they do understand it a bit more. So, but this will be an interesting case and we really need to wrap it up because we're at an hour and 30 minutes. So do you have anything? Right. This is actually a really interesting discussion. I know that I put out most of my opinion on these cases, but uh, are there any cases that y'all want us to actually do a deep dive on and really pull out um, more information on what's going on with these cases? Uh, are there any cases in the past that you want us to talk about? Let us know. Um, yeah. Can I give just a nutshell? Yeah. Okay. You got Chief Justice Roberts, born 1955. Clarence Thomas, born 1948. Stephen Breyer, born 1938. Uh, Justice Alito, born 1950. Justice Sotomayor, 1954. Ellen Kagan, Justice Kagan, 1960. Neil Gorsuch, 1967. Okay, he's your age. Kavanaugh, 1965. Okay. And then... uh, Tony Barrett, Amy, I believe, is Tony in her Barrett, 72. Yeah. So the ones so in the 60s 50. kind of are kind of young. I, I say that relatively speaking, 50 is not 50s are not old. And, you know, like your generation started on the Internet as well. Well, your generation was there at the beginning of the Internet. So, we, you know. Yeah, my generation kind of created the internet. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't it didn't come into its prime until after my generation. Right. So- and as such, you got the youngest person being 72, 1972, 50 years old. They didn't grow up with it. That's true. It's very true. They've used it, but they didn't grow up with it like my generation. Right. So they really need to talk with some of their clerks, which are their clerks are basically your age. And younger and find out, you know, exactly how social media works. I don't even know how social media works. I just use it. (laughs) There's a reason why there's classes. Yeah. People whose sole jobs are social media. It's ever evolving. 
But with that, um, we're going to uh, wrap this up. It's a little bit longer because, uh, you know, I did what I said I wasn't going to do, but that's okay. Thank you so much for listening to Learning the Law. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, and share in all your favorite places. You can find it hosted live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Phoenix and Infi. Use the hashtag learning the law on all social media platforms to follow more. You can find Ron on Twitter at Necrokijo. That's N-E-C-R-O-K-I-J-O. And Ashley, that's me on both social media platforms at Phoenix Nymphy. If you have any questions, please tweet, comment, or email us at twolazydogsmedia at gmail.com. This has been a Two Lazy Dogs production. Bye, everyone. <laughs>